Joy has been a columnist for Newsday since 2006, when she won the Long Island Press Club Columnist Award. She joined the newspaper in 1983 and has worked as a reporter, an editor, newsroom administrator, and editorial writer. She has been a part of several award-winning efforts, including a 1984 Pulitzer Prize local reporting team. In 2000, she won awards from the Deadline Club, the National Headline <coughs> Awards, the New York Newspaper Publishers Association, and the Society of Salarians for Editorial Writing. Before coming to Newsday, Joy was a reporter for the News and Observer in Raleigh, North Carolina, and the Chicago Tribune. And Joy has been a, a, native, a, a native of Washington, D.C., has a bachelor's in journalism from George Washington University. Please help me welcome Joy Brown. soon. Jeez, I'm scaring the heck out of me up here. Um, my job is to give you a little bit of history. Uh, but before I do that, don't get my time yet. Oh, I'm not. Okay, good. <laughs> I came to Newsday almost 36 years ago, and my first assignment was as Minority Affairs Reporter. Now, one of the interesting things is that over 36 years, there are people that I've talked to, and many, or some of them, are actually in this room. Um, I'm talking like grandchildren to these people at this particular point. But if you have been active in the quest for equity on Long Island, can you just raise your hand? Because that's where I know you guys from. Raise them up. Up, 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 way up, high, high, high. Now, the rest of the room, you can take a look at that. I mean, these, some of these folks have been doing this for longer than I've been here on Long Island. And I just thought that we should take a look at that, that this is not coming out of nowhere. I'm going to kick it up old school. I could have done slides, chose not to because I don't know how to. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so what I want to do is sort of bring us down a little bit and I'm asked to take a look at history. I'm not going to start at the Paleo Indians on Long Island. I'm going to start when I first came to Long Island. I'm going to share with you some of the things that we did uh, at Newsday on Long Island. I've been on Long Island for about a year when I actually did my first series and it was called Legacy of the Slumlord. Legacy of the Slumlord. How many of you have been to a Ducks game? How many of you have been to the courthouse out there, that beautiful stretch of everything that's out there? For me it's different. I see something different because I know what was there before that was there. This is I, this is written in we're in 1984. All right? Out there, there were homes, actually. And I met a young woman there, her name, Claritha. And what she told me was that when she put her kids to bed at night, she put cotton in their ears because she had had a guest in her home and a cockroach had gone in her ears. And let me read you a little bit of what Claritha's life was like in one of those homes in that area where, Dark, where Duck Stadium is now. She lives on Pine Street. She says she'd been trying to make a home for her family despite the rats, bad plumbing, and spongy floors. In her four-room house, the front door leans to one side and can't be locked. Her bathroom sink drains into a bucket, and she must use pliers to turn on the shower. Now remember, I worked in North Carolina. I have never, ever in my life seen the kind of squalor that I saw over there, ever. Now what's also interesting is in the same story, I talked to some guy named Lee Koppelman. You know who he is, yes? All right, here's what he says. He said that housing for poor people, and remember, 1984, poor means more than poor. Housing for poor people would continue to deteriorate as long as communities block efforts to build low and moderate income housing. He said the situation was particularly bleak for blacks and Hispanics, groups made up by the bulk of tenants. These properties were owned by one guy, James Northrop. He was the largest slumlord on Long Island. And that's, this, were, this was his legacy. But Lee went on to say, you attack a guy like Northrop, he's telling me, 
but we haven't provided housing for those on limited incomes. It hasn't been perceived as good politics because people who come here from New York City don't want anything to do with poor people. 1984. 1987. I wish Larry Levy were here. Uh, I started out as a reporter on this project and ended up as an editor. How many of you have been to Long Beach? Beautiful, beautiful Long Beach. All right? When I go to Long Beach, I see something a little bit different maybe from what you've seen. Try this out. In an effort to revive a dying city, Long Beach officials drove out thousands of the poor, the elderly, and ex-mental patients, many of them blacks and Hispanics, whose lives were rooted in the community. At almost every turn, officials used and sometimes abused a powerful legal arsenal to not only force out the needy, but to block virtually every public and private effort to help them stay. With astonishing speed, the city displaced at least three thousand people, or about 10% of Long Beach's population. By targeting adult homes and old apartments for demolition to make way for giant co-ops and glittering condominiums, sometimes council members and political leaders say they drove around the city at night, picking out buildings for destruction. The city ripped down buildings that didn't have to be, as the city manager said. My feeling is that they were trying to not just discourage the poor, but to drive them out. Now, on this particular story, I started as a reporter and ended up as an editor. Larry Levy actually wrote this. Um, and among the papers I found in the old Allard Lowenstein Library, does anybody remember? They changed the name. It was a city planning document. And the city planning document actually stated as city policy that they wanted, what they wanted to do was to drive out, quote, dependent populations. Now, just for a point of contrast here, I think today there's a report out on Patchogue, and they talk about how they revitalized the city. It took them 17 years. Here, it took three. Fast forward, 1990, there's this puppy right here. Long Island World Park. This was 30 years old. I know because my daughter's gonna turn 30. And in here, we polled people, we did all kinds of things to talk about segregation and its impact on Long Island. Not just on minority folks, black and, and, and brown folk, which is what we're talking about in 1990. Today we're talking about something totally different. Um, and this piece of, of writing here led to me talking to the Long Island Community Kent Foundation and what I find fascinating is that something grew out of that committee's commitment to do something about segregation on Long Island. Can you guess what grew out of it? Erase racism. Long Island, our story. This is our history book. And I worked hard on this puppy. We all did. It's old now and it's incomplete. I can't tell you how much is missing from this thing. I wish I knew as much now as I did then. But let's go take a little walk down memory lane here. I met a guy, his name was Link, Link, Lincoln Lynch, Lincoln O. Lynch. Consider this, 1963. He's at the Garden City Hotel. The NAACP is gonna give him an award. He goes up, he stands up in front of the group, and he opens up his mouth. And he kind of surprised him a little bit. Here in Nassau County, he said, and indeed in the very village of Garden City in which we now meet, racial discrimination and segregation cry out loud for correction. All over Nassau, from Inwood to Oyster Bay, from Glen Cove and Manhasset, Port Washington, or our supposedly fabulous North Shore, to Freeport and Farmingdale and Roosevelt, and across the border in Amityville, there exists shameless evidence of undescribed discrimination. This is 1963. When I spoke to him, this was, let's see, 1988, 89. And I said to him, I'm like, dude, huh? well, yeah, Mr. Lynch, uh, <laughs> what's your most successful, he's a very courtly man, I found him in Manhattan. You know, what was your most successful achievement? There's a photo in here, by the way, of him being dragged away by police. What was your most successful achievement? And he said, we made people aware of the conditions that existed and what they could do about it. No one else had dared to meet the situation head on. I said, what well, was your least successful? 
He said, bringing more black students into the movement. We made the mistake, he said, of educating white people on Island too much rather than educating black students on how to be effective activists. You saw some statistics here on the diversification of Long Island. It, this is not new. This is not new. 1993, we did a special section just for Nassau County back when we had money <laughs> at Newstead. And in here, we talked about new issues, new faces. 1993. And what this says is that populations growing on Long Island were Asian, and still are. Latino, except we called them Hispanics back then, still are. And we quoted uh, Ray Lopez, who was Hempstead Town's first deputy commissioner. He said, holy cow, people say, people say, holy cow, look who's moving in. He says, we're going to be here, and they're going to have to learn to accept us. Again, 1993. We've Fast forward, we've seen some remarkable things happening on Long Island. I'm going to take it to last month. Yeah, last month. <laughs> this is December, right? Elections. Andrew Cuomo would have lost Suffolk County for the second election cycle in a row had it not been for black, brown, and yellow votes. The state senate in Albany changed power, right? After all of these years, that would not have happened without minority votes. It is extraordinary. And I'll take one district, Community of Brentwood. Right now, the Community of Brentwood, and it's a perfect bracket here, will be represented in Albany by two different people. One is Phil Ramos, Puerto Rican. Right? There are people in Brentwood who today can tell you that they grew up smelling cinnamon buns because people worked in the Antonin's factory. Before that, they worked in the mental health institutions out there. Puerto Ricans have been a part of Long Island for decades, dating back to the 40s. On the other end, you have Monica Martinez, Salvadoran. And again, Salvadorans are the largest Latino group on Long Island. So Brentwood is kind of a perfect example of where we are now. And I'm going to leave you with this. This is an editorial that appeared in Newsday. And the, the, the title on it was, Why a Long Island Without Racism would be better for everyone. Long Island has spent a lot of time patting themselves on the back for keeping the island from it in the oft-repeated words of local politicians becoming just like Queens. An acceptable Long Island thing, what Queens like is urban and that's bad. What Long Island like is suburban and safe and relatively wealthy and white and that's considered good. In the effort to keep things as they are, however, Long Islands are strangling the region's chance of maturing as an economic center and is a vibrant, viable reason. region. They, let's admit it, we are narrowing the possibility even of keeping our own children on Long Island. We're bungling any opportunity to address the very real problems from open space to multifamily housing. That was written in 2002. 2002. So what we're facing now is not anything that's new. The diversification of Long Island has, it, it has accelerated. Um, you know, from a business perspective, since this is a business group, these are customers, these are business people, these are the, you know, and for a region where small business is the biggest part of our economic pie, these folks are important. These folks, most of all, are our neighbors. And with that, I get to go back over there and sit down. Thank you.